thank you, worship team, for, for that. But thank you, author, whoever wrote that song. Um, in First Peter's chapter 1, it says that the salvation that we have been recept, we have received are things that even angels long to look into. Even angels, when we were singing that, angels were singing that with us and they were saying, it just does not make sense that the God and the creator of this world will become a man and suffer at the hands of sinners. It does not make sense. And even angels, they cannot understand that. They were crying out, why, oh why, oh king of glory, are you suffering at these, at the hands of these sinners? That's, that's the song. That's what this song means. Even angels don't understand. I love what this old pastor says. He says, when you get into the heavens, the new heavens and new earth, there will be only the first question that all of us will ask will be the same question. You might have many questions in your mind about what about certain things in your life that you don't understand. But when you get into the kingdom of heaven, there will be one question that all of us will ask. And that is the question, why, Jesus, did you die for me? Why? That's what you will ask. And I thank God because many people in this room, you just weep with me when you think of that. You just, you just fall down. Yes, just now a sister shared that yesterday she, she watched the movie and just praise God and fall flat on the ground for an hour. Well, you know, you, I think you'll probably spend the first hundred years in heaven just on the ground asking Jesus, why did you die for me? Why me? I made fun of you. I rejected you. I was ashamed of you at school and you forgave me. Why did you do that? We will spend eternity discovering what that's like. But I'd like us to turn. This is the first week of Advent. And thank James, he, he, he brought these candles in. The first week of Advent, as we lead on towards the greatest day of the year and the greatest day in all of history, the day when Jesus Christ became man. But I'd like us to turn first to the, the, the topic The theme chapter of our year, which is Psalm 27. In Psalm 27, the author, he prays the prayer we've been praying for a whole year, which is that we would see the beauty and the glory of Christ. So if you, if you don't know where Psalms is, well, just side up to a Christian next to you. They, they'd love to help you find it. Um, Psalm 27. I'm going to read it to you because this is exactly how the Hebrew, the author of Hebrews ends. We, we are, we are in Hebrews, but here this author ends the same way as the psalmist here in 27. David writes, The Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me and eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army come against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. For He will hide me in His shelter in the day of trouble, he will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high above upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in this tent sacrifices and shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Heal, o, hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and seek and answer me. You have said, seek my face. And my heart says to you, your face, Lord. Do I seek? Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my mother and my father have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up 
to the will of my adversaries. For false witnesses have risen against me and they breathe out violence. But I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage and wait for the Lord. Do you see now, if you flip to Hebrews 13, that this is exactly what is echoed here in chapter 13. I'm going to read you verse 4, 5, and 6 of chapter 13 of Hebrews. This is where we are this morning. The author says, and he said, he's quoting from Joshua chapter 1. God says to you and to me, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Even if your father and mother forsake you, God says to you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And the song that we sang, that second song, even in your weakness, He will not forsake you. Even in your sin, He will not forsake you if you turn to Him. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then verse 6, that's why we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? You see, that's just an echo of what was written almost a thousand years before this author had written these words in Hebrews when David wrote, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? God is so good. He will not forsake you. Your family may forsake you. We have been praying a lot for one of our families whose father is forsaking them. He has just taken him off and left the family and forsaken his daughters. But God says, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Your friends will forsake you, just as they forsook, they forsook Jesus at the cross. But Jesus' words to you are the same in 1000 B.C., in the year 50 A.D., and in the year 2017. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Yesterday I was so grateful. I, I sat in the ministry that Ted and Margaret have been leading for more than 20 years. If you don't know, one of the reasons for the growth of Grace Church, a big part of it has come from the ministry of Ted and Margaret, their Bible classes on Monday night, Friday night, Saturday morning. They've been doing this for 20 odd more years. And she stands, Margaret, and she just teaches for three hours. Yesterday I saw that and I said, Man, I don't have any reason to complain if I preach two or three times a week. But yesterday she told this story and it just brought me to tears. And I think it will for you too. She said there was once this, in the prairies, like Saskatchewan and Regina, where there are just wheat fields as far as the eye can see. And sometimes in these wheat fields, the the air gets so hot that sometimes the spontaneously there will be fire that just bursts out. And one time there was a fire that broke out in the middle of the prairies and the firefighters came in. They had a really hard time fighting that fire because the winds were blowing so hard. If you've been into the prairie land, you know there are no mountains and no buildings to diverge those winds. So the wind blew on that fire and it grew really, really strong. But finally, after a lot of fight, the, the firefighters were able to quench the fire. And they were walking through the fields of wheat looking for hot spots because there are embers that are left over from the flame to douse them with water. And as they were walking through that field, they came upon a lump, not greater than this, a lump just on the ground. And so she, the firefighters came up to that and one of the firefighters just kicked that lump with his foot. And suddenly underneath came scouring out a bunch of little yellow chicks that ran out from under that hen. And then the firefighter knew that what had happened was the fire was so great and the hen knew that she was nowhere to go. So she just sat down and gave her life up so that the little chicks under her would live. And you know, Jesus, he said the same thing. In Luke 13, he said, Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. He was coming into the city 
and he looked at the city and just cried out, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. You're not willing to come under my wing. And yet, we know that when they took Jesus and they crucified him on the cross, they thought they were doing something for the sake of their country and their nation and their own will. They thought they were just doing it out of their own jealousy. Even the Pharisees didn't know what they were doing. But Jesus did. Jesus went to the cross and he died for the people because he was like that hen who when the fires came, of judgment came, he sat right down on all of Jerusalem to be saved and so that he would be scorched and so that Jesus would die so that the fury and wrath of God would rest upon him. That's the gospel. And anyone who hears that should cry out to their heart, Why? Why did you do that, Jesus? They hated you. They wanted to murder you. And you went and you gathered them like like chicks and you sat on them and you let the fury of God fall on you. Yesterday when Margaret said that, I was a bad I just wept. Just wept. The Lord will never forsake you. If Jesus is willing to die for his enemies, he will never forsake you, his people. You don't have to fear anything. You don't have to fear anything. Thursday night, we had 12 of us, university students and one of my dear brothers, Andrew. We went out on McGill campus and we started sharing the gospel to these people and and as with all of these street evangelism, there's a lot of, sometimes you're a little afraid, there's, you don't know what to expect. And it was raining really hard that day, and it was really cold out there, I guess, that day. But thank God for the rain and for the cold. Because that day when we walked out on the streets, we walked out of McGill, and there's this underpass right next to the McLennan Library. And as we turned that pass, there were just more than 20 or 30 people huddled there, smoking cigarettes, and it was so cold, so they were in groups of three or four, and smoking their cigarettes. And I told Bowen and Daniel, the two brothers who were with me, I'm like, thank God for cigarettes today. Because these guys, they're out there smoking, and when we were spreading the gospel to them, we could share the gospel with three or four here, pray with them, and then just turn our bodies, and three or four again here. And that night we spoke the gospel to more than 50 people. We were only 12. Praise God. Even he, you, God even uses cigarette smoking and the cold rainy weather to make his word known to the people who are lost. And you know, when we just prayed over these people, they're like, wait, are you really talking to us about Jesus? I said, yeah, really. He's like, what did Jesus do so great in your life? I said, let me tell you. How much time do you have? <laughs> Praise God. Many people heard the gospel that night. Do not be afraid. The world can do nothing to you. In fact, the worst that happened was somebody's told me, he said, I have a lot of exams to share. And he left, and he left this girl named Maria from Colombia. And she sat down, she said, well, tell me, Joseph, what did Jesus do to you? And I still tell her, I could see a glimmer in her eye. And as I left, she said, can I have that little paper that you have in your hand? I said, sure, you can have that. And I prayed over her. She had never heard the gospel preached to her like that. Do not be afraid. God is with you wherever you go. And if the sword of the Spirit is in your hand, you can go out into battle and nothing can stop you. It's not because you're powerful. It's because the God who you serve is in control of the entire universe. Do not be afraid. But we are here in... Hebrews 13, and this whole chapter is about application. It's about working out your faith. After 12 chapters of talking about the beauty and the glory of Christ, he comes here to this chapter, and the reason why he does this is because works matter. 
Application matters. Application and living out your faith really matters. The most blessed people in all of Scripture, if you know a little bit about what Jesus says about the happiest people in the world, there are those who are persecuted for the gospel. There are those who mourn for their non-Christian friends and family. There are those who seek to be peacemakers. Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are those who are peacemakers, for they shall be called sons and daughters of God. You see, the people who are blessed are those who apply the word of Jesus to their life. They're the happiest people in this world. I love what Cindy shared in our Bible study on Friday, the Jeremiah group. She said this. I love that. She read from 1 Peter 4. You don't have to turn to it. I'll read it to you. 1 Peter chapter 4 said this. She said, she was reading this. It says, 1 Peter chapter 4. If anyone insults you for the name of Jesus Christ, you are blessed or you are happy. If anybody insults you because you're a Christian, you should be happy because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Oh man, when I heard that on Friday, I said to her, I, more and more should we go out on the street and evangelize so that if people just insult us, laugh at us for, because, because we're Christians, then that means the spirit of glory is greater and greaterly more and more resting upon us. Why wouldn't we want that? Why wouldn't we want more and more of the spirit of glory coming upon us as we are insulted and persecuted for the sake of the gospel? So you come to Hebrews 13 and you see here, verses 13, this author says, Therefore, let us go to Jesus outside the camp and bear the reproach that Jesus bore, that Jesus endured. But what is this reproach? Well, if you look up, look at what this says in verse 11. For the bodies of the animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. What the author is saying here was when the Jewish people came to offer sacrifices to God, they bring these massive animals into the temple. Then they'd slaughter them and offer the blood of these animals as a sacrifice, as a atonement for their sins. But what do you do with these carcasses? What do you do with the, the carcasses of these bulls and these goats and sheep? You can't leave them in the temple. It would reek. So they would take these animals and they would take them outside the camp, outside the city, and to burn them outside. But look at what G the author says here in verse 12. He says, so Jesus, just as those carcasses are brought outside, so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Do you see what it means here? Jesus' body and his death was not even worth more than the carcasses of animals that the Jewish people threw out of the city. That is the humiliation and the reproach that Jesus bore. And if you're a Christian this morning, you should just weep at that. His death and resurrection, his body wasn't even worth carcasses of animals. They took them out. And if you know anything about the historic way they treated crucified criminals, they stripped them totally naked and put them on the highways of their city so that everyone would mock them. That's the way Jesus died. That's the reproach he bore. But the author says, Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. Because, verse 14, Because here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. When Jesus Christ enters into your heart, when you receive his forgiveness into your life, everything 
changes. That's what I was telling those people Thursday night, those universities. I said, I'm just like you. I was just like you. I was a university student here. I wanted the same things like you, but I wasn't happy. And I said, are you happy? And they like, I, 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 I don't know. I, I don't. They couldn't answer me. I said, you're not happy. You, you can't be happy because you don't know why you live. And one of these guys, forget his name, this Asian brother, he was smoking a cigarette and he said, well, you know, you just have to deal with that uncertainty. Life is just like that. You just have to deal with it. And I said, no, you don't. You don't have to live a life not knowing where you're going to go. You don't have to live a life and die and just think that that will be the end. That doesn't need to be the end. We spoke to Muslims and they're like, well, I believe in Allah. And I'm like, yes, but you don't even know it because you're smoking a cigarette and it for, you're forbidden to smoke cigarettes in Islam and you're smoking it in front of me. Don't tell me that you're happy. You're not happy. I, I didn't say that to them. I said that in my own heart. But you see, it drives your evangelism that way. Because when you see the people of this world and they don't know where they're going, your heart is just so painful for that. I'm so blessed because recently I met, I just shared his testimony so much. I met, I met this brother called Andrew. His name used to be Amro. He's a prof, he's a, he's a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, officially. And you know, he, he, when he heard that we were gonna go and evangelize at McGill on Thursday, he said, I wanna go. I have, it's my day off, but he said, if the Satan never takes a day off, I'm not taking a day off. I'm coming with you guys. He came with us. He came earlier than all of us. Even I was late. He came earlier than all of us. And he was, he was there and he started praying for that. And you know what he told our group? He said, he said, listen to this. He said, look at all these people walking around in McGill. They're all walking towards hell. Can you accept that? I'm like, we're all like, no, we can't. And he was saying that 12 of us. He's like, and imagine our brothers and sisters in China are being persecuted for the gospel. And we won't even tell the people about Jesus because we're, we're afraid of being rejected. Can you live with that? And we're like, no, we can't. Sorry. Like, man, that guy drove us to evangelize that night. And he said, whenever you guys are doing it, just give me a call. We'll come. What is the drive in this guy's life? And what is the drive in this, in, in, in these missionaries' life that they will be able to say with Jesus, I will come with you outside the camp and bear the reproach. I don't care what people say to me anymore. I don't care what people think about me anymore. I just want to please you. What drives that? Well, it's verse 14. Here we have no lasting city. But we seek a city that is to come. If you remember what we've been talking about in chapter 12, verse 28 of chapter 12 says, Let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. The whole kingdom of heaven belongs to you now. What, what more, what can you lose? You can't lose anything. What, you cannot lose anything. You have the kingdom of heaven. Why do you even want money? Why do you want a couple hundred thousand dollars? Why do you want a couple hundred million dollars? The kingdom of heaven is yours. The angels are going to bow down before your feet. Why do you want to be rich? That's why the author said here in verse five and six, he says, let your life be free from love of money because, oh, Christian, if in this life you want money, you have not understood the gospel. You don't know what it is that you are. You don't know what a wonder you are. You don't know that you're a prince and princess of, of the kingdom of God. And you will one day sit on the throne with Jesus. You don't know that. And that's why you love money. I know what that's like. I love money for a lot of my life. And God, it took God several years to change that in me. But this is what this chapter is about. Application matters. But let me ask you a question. Are you saved by faith or by works? Are you justified before God by faith? Or by works, because I just said ma application matters and works matter. So what is the relationship between faith and works? Which one saves you? Well, if you are, if you're a student of Paul, you'll quote to me Romans 4 and you'll say, well, it says here, Abraham was, if, if Abraham was justified by works, 
well, then he has something to boast about. But he wasn't justified by works. He was justified by faith, and therefore he has nothing to boast about. But let me read to you James. You see, we believe in one Bible. As even Martin Luther didn't like the book of James, but we like it, and so he had to repent of that. But James chapter 2 says this. Just listen to it. You don't have to turn to it. Just listen. He says, Abraham, our father, was justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar. You see that faith was active along with his works, and his faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled saying that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. Verse 24. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Wow. My uh, liberal theologian friends just will have a have a day trip with this, and they say, "Look, see, the Bible is contradicting itself. James is in conflict with Paul. Which are you? Are you justified by faith or justified by works?" But let me read you this. This I mean, people who say that they just don't understand what faith really is. Let me read you what Paul says in Galatians, and you'll see Paul is not contradicting James. He's not contradicting James. Galatians 5, verse 6. You don't have to turn to that. Just read it. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. Listen. But only faith working through love. What Paul says in Galatians 5, verse 6 is, circumcision doesn't matter. Uncircumcision doesn't matter. Only one thing matters. Faith working through Love. Do you hear that? Faith working through love. You are saved by faith that works through love. You are saved by faith that works. If your faith doesn't work, that is not real faith. There's no contradiction between Paul and James. We are saved by faith that produces a work of love in us that causes us to love God and love man. And both must be present. You cannot say you love God, but you have no love for your brother. That would be a lie. All this is by grace. Grace gives you the faith, and the faith produces in you the work of love. So, let me sum this up. You are saved by grace through faith that works out love. You are saved by grace through faith that works out love. You can test yourself to see if you have true faith. You just have to ask yourself, am I becoming more and more loving? That's what this chapter 13 is about. Verse 1, let brotherly love continue. So are you growing deeper in love? If you are, then that faith is real. If not, then today, today is the day for you to turn. Maybe Jesus has just been a fact, a line in, in, the, in the database of your mind, your mind, and, and he's not, he's not real. And for that to be transcribed to your heart, takes the work of the Spirit. And that's that's the work that you can be praying for. My, my seminary professor used to say this. He said, the, what, he asked, used to ask us, what is the longest or the greatest distance in all the world, all, all the universe? And we'd say, like, uh, the distance between the two expanses of the universe? He's like, no. The greatest distance in all the universe is the distance from your mind and your heart. That distance is the greatest distance in the entire universe. And only the Spirit can help you shorten that distance. So, faith and works, they matter. Faith works through love. So today, we're going to focus on one thing. It's a very difficult passage to to preach on, especially for me. Um, We saw that in chapter verses 1 to 6, it's loving God and loving man. Those two loves. But here in verse 7, I'm going to read a few verses from chapter 13 to see you now where he asks us to turn our love towards. Verse 7, 
Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for your heart to be strengthened by grace and not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. I'm going to jump down to verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Who is this author now calling us to love? First it's loving man, then it's loving God, and here, love your leaders. Love your leaders. Who are your leaders? You may not know this. Reverend Chern is one of our leaders. I'm one of your leaders. But if anyone here in this church is a teacher of the Word of God, because it says in verse 7, it's those who have spoken the Word of God, anyone who teaches the words, if you're a Bible study leader, then you're a leader. If you're a small group leader, you're a leader. If you're a worship team leader, or if you lead worship, if anyone who stands up here and leads worship, you're a leader. We have many deacons and elders in this church. They are your el- your leaders. And the scripture says today, love your leaders. Obey and submit to them, verse 17. What does that mean? What does that mean? What kind of leaders do we obey? When does that obedience begin? And when does that obedience cease? Okay. But first, just a word about what the responsibilities of a re- leader is. Here you see that the re- responsibility of a, re- of a leader is to speak the word of God. Verse 7. Remember the, your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. A leader is not just someone who has a really loud voice and who can command a lot of influence. No. A leader is someone who speaks the word of truth, either singing it or living it or teaching it. Second, a leader is someone who is an example in his way of life. Verse 7 again. It says, consider the outcome of their life. That means look at the way that they live and imitate their faith. Well, what is there to look at? It's an example of faith, example of their lifestyles. That's why it matters how you live it out as a leader. I'm going to give you a list. I'll show you a list of characteristics that a leader has, as should have. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Let no one despise you. This is Paul talking to Timothy. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. In speech. What does it mean to be an example in speech? That means that it's not just what you say in church that matters. It matters how you answer the telephone. I must say that many of us, I think, need to learn how to answer the telephone. Sometimes people call my house and they say, Hi, 你是谁? Hi, who are you? I, that's, that's quite rude, actually. You're calling me. I, I should ask, who are you? Maybe introduce yourself. Maybe, maybe tell me what you're calling me for. Oh, bye bye. You know, a lot of times I get those calls when I was living at my parents' house. It was like that. It matters the way you speak. If you want to be a leader, you set an example in speech, not just in the church, but outside of church. Let me give you an example of how even the world understands this better than many churches do. I'm a big fan of reading business books and understanding entrepreneurship. There's a, there's a Taiwanese CEO called Tony Tsai. He's the uh, CEO of Zappos.com. Maybe some girls know because you order shoes from them. Well, Zappos.com is the most successful shoe business online. And when they hire people, they go through this vigorous interview with their hire, their, their, their potential candidate hirees. A vigorous interview. They ask you all the things. Make sure you're competent. And then after the interview, they ask you, they say, great, we'll call you. And then immediately after the interview, they go and they ask the driver of the shuttle bus that drove the guy 
the, 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 the interviewee from the airport to their business, their company. And they will ask this driver, so did this, did this, um, did this person say hi to you? Did they greet you? Did they tip you? Were they kind to you? Did they strike up conversation? Even though they were so nervous, right? They're going to a job interview. Did they strike up interview? When you ask them question about how they are, were they just brushing you off? Or did they shoot you with a spec? And you know, this company, they said they will not hire anyone that the driver does not like. Wow. Wow. Think about your way of speech outside the walls of this church. And think, are they setting an example as a Christ follower? Do they edify or do they destroy? When I was going through high school, I lived a double life. And I know many of you do because I hear it. I would come to church and my speech would be pure, full of praise, full of exaltation to God. I would lead worship sometimes. I'd get to school and my mouth would be full of filth and profanity. I would swear here and there. F this, S that, M that, all the words that you can think of. And even one day, my friend, my non-Christian friend, Jeff Delier, came up to me and he said, Dude, you're a Christian, right? And I'm like, I just have to do it. Your speech inside and outside the church matters. In conduct, inside and outside the church matters. The way you drive outside matters. When you're driving on the streets as a leader of this church, and if you're getting really impatient with people and you're just like, you know, cursing them inside your heart, and being really impatient with people, if the homeless are coming up to you and squeegeeing your windows and you, you, you wipe the windshield wipers, oh, repent. That is not the way Christians ought to live. In gentleness and in kindness, says our Lord. In faith. What does it mean to be an example in faith? Well, it means to be bold for the sake of the gospel. Leaders ought to be the first ones on the street leading evangelism teams in purity. What does it mean to be examples in purity? Well, that means that you love all things that are good and pure and you hate anything that is evil. You hate it with a passion. You will not even touch certain things that have, that, that promote evil or that encourage people to evil. That's what, that's what it means to be an example in purity. You won't even touch certain things that lead people to evil. It's not because those things necessarily are that bad, but for the sake of other people, you say, I will not do those things. That's what it means to set an example in purity. A good test of this is just simply to ask yourself, if Jesus Christ were to come to your house next week, okay, if you were to come to your home next week, how would your lifestyle change today? How would it change? And if the answer to that question is, nothing would change, then you are blessed. You are a faithful soldier of God, and you are just blessed. Nothing needs to change. That means you're living exactly according to what God wants you to do. Thank God for that. But if the answer is, there's a lot of things that would change. Maybe there's a lot of things I would get rid of in my house. I don't want Jesus to see that. I don't want Jesus seeing me wear that. I don't want that piece of clothing to be in Jesus' sight. I don't want Jesus to see me doing these things. I don't think Jesus would be happy hearing me say those things. Well then, today is the day of salvation. Today is the first day of Advent, but it's also the first week of the month. It's Holy Communion. It's a time for you to just be reconciled with God and say, God, I want to be a leader in the church. I want to be a soldier in the kingdom of heaven. And I want to be an example in purity, faith, conduct, and speech. And he will answer that prayer. You pray things according to the will of God, it will be done. He wants it to happen. But the question that I think bothers a lot of us is, why are we called to submit to these earthly rulers? Why are you called to submit to your deacons? If you don't know your deacons, who are nominated this year and in this congregation are Max Chow, Cecil Quash, and Evelyn Chin. They were serving already last year, but this year we're going to confirm them as deacons. Why are you called to submit and obey them? Why are you called to submit to Elder Liu or Elder Edward? Why are you called to submit to these guys? 
Well, here it says, in verse 17, it says, Obey your leaders and submit to them because they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. So tell me, you can shout the answer out if you want. Who are these leaders responsible to? To other elders? To me as a pastor? No. Who are they responsible to? It says here, as those who have to give an account, but give an account to who? To God. Not to me. To God. James chapter 3 says this, Not many of you should want to be teachers, because you should know that we who teach will be judged with greater severity. I don't want to discourage you from becoming a Sunday school teacher. And that's not what this verse means either. He means that if you want to be a teacher, you need to set a standard in the way that you live. It doesn't mean you already have to achieve the standard, but it means that you have to strive for that standard because you will have to give an account to God. And therefore, your deacons and your elders and your pastors, they're under the authority of God. If they serve well, they will be rewarded by God. If they serve poorly, they will be judged by God. You don't have to get angry at them. You can let God do the work of transformation in their lives. We are called to submit to our leaders because, and by the way, I am someone under authority too. I don't call the shots here. (laughs) That would be terrible. Pastor Wu Hao is my lead pastor. I submit to his authority. And both of us submit currently to the authority of Reverend Chern. And we as the pastoral staff and as the elders board, we submit to the authority of the district superintendent, Pastor Kenzo, who came several months ago. And he and all his team and all the churches of Canada submit to the authority of President Pastor David Chern. Uh, David, sorry, David Hearn, not David Chern. Maybe one day. Maybe one day my son David will perhaps be there, but not now. David Hearn. We are under authority and we submit to their leadership and you submit to the leaders here and you are called to do that not because they're competent necessarily, not because they're necessarily great charismatic leaders, but because it says here they're under God's authority. They're held accountable to God. And here the burning question is for all of us is, what about incompetent people? What about bad leaders? How do you submit to those people? And as Friday we were studying this in our small groups, one of their brothers said, what about dumb leaders? If the leader is really dumb, do we still obey and submit to them? Well, let's get some things straight first and foremost. Obviously, this passage is not telling us to obey them if they tell us to sin, right? Obviously. We are not to obey sin. But, if it's just dumb, if the command or the order or the plan is simply dumb, it's not sin, it's simply very dumb, verse says here, obey and submit to your leaders. Why? You should be very, very uncomfortable. What does this mean? What about those really dumb decisions? that the elders and the deacons sometimes may or may not make? What about the really dumb decisions that the pastors make? What do we do with that? What about all the bad pastors who, yes, they love God, but they don't know anything about management. They don't know anything about marketing. They don't know anything about leadership. What do we do with these people? They're incompetent people. In most churches these days, people just leave. They're like, we're going to a better church. See ya. That's not what God wants. God's intention is for all of us to submit to authority that he has appointed. And this, even I was reminded of recently. You see, I work with leaders, some of them whom I love. I just thank God that I work with these leaders. But other leaders who I almost cannot stand. And I remember coming to Montreal and serving here, and sometimes I just think like, God, why is this person here? Why is this person in that position of leadership? They're totally not just incompetent, but there are areas of their life that are just evil. There are people, things in their life that are wrong. Do we submit and obey that? They weren't commanding me to do things that are wrong, but they themselves were living in situations that were very wrong. And How do I deal with that? 
And I remembered the exam- two examples from Scripture that really caused me to repent. Because in my heart, I had begun, begun be- becoming very bitter towards these people, murmuring under my mouth, and then really getting angry at these people. And every time we were, I saw them in my heart, I said, this one, take them away, take them away. And that's not what God intended it. Because I remember when David was being chased by King Saul, one of the evil kings of Israel. I'll tell you how Saul, how evil he was. Saul was so jealous of David that when he went to go seek after and chase after David, at one point he said, tell me who, where David is. And then one, another evil man called Id, Edom, he said, I know where he is. He went to the priests of Nob. And then when Saul came to the priests of Nob, he said, why did you help David? And then he called and he killed all the priests and all their family. That's how evil Saul was. And when Saul was placed right into the pl- in front of David, in fact, the story is quite amazing. In 1 Samuel 24, Saul was relieving himself. That means he was going to the bathroom, and there was no bathrooms, and obviously in those days. There was a cave. He went into the cave to relieve himself, and he didn't know that right behind him was David and his army. I, I, that must have been a massive cave because David's army is about 400 people. <laughs> and they were really quiet. And then one of the soldiers, and then David, he took his sword and he cut the corner off of the robe of, of Saul. And the scripture says about that, it says, as soon as David cut the robe off of Saul's robe, it says his heart struck him. That means he felt so guilty because he had cut off a corner off of Saul's robe and he said to his men he turned to his men after Saul had left he said the Lord forbids me that I should do this evil thing to my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed and he said the Lord should forbid that I would put out my hand against him seeing that he is the Lord's anointed that was the first time Saul later on he had a season of repentance because David told him about this but then he, in chapter 26, two chapters later, Saul again wants to go seek after David and wants to kill him again. And this time, David and his one of his best soldiers, Abishai, they get into the camp. They walk into the camp. Everyone is asleep because the scripture says the Lord made them fall deeply asleep. He walks into the camp and his soldier, his, his right-hand man, Abishai, says to David, David, just tell me. Let me go right now and I will take the spear and I will drive it through Saul right away. Just say the word. He says, I will not strike twice. Just say the word, David. And David said, David said, do not destroy him. For who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As the Lord lives, the Lord will strike Saul, not me. And when I remember that, I repented. Because in my heart, the bitterness that I had towards my leaders was guilty. I was guilty of that. You are called not just to submit and honor and respect amazing leaders, but also poor leaders, incompetent leaders, and even evil leaders. You don't have to obey his commands, but you show them due respect and honor. North Americans have a very hard time with this because we have been taught since we were young to be very critical of authority and be very critical of leadership. We, we talk about President Trump, Justin Trudeau, with such disregard. Oh, he's such a... And as bad as a leader as they may be, the scripture commands us, people of God, to respect them and to show them due honor. Do not speak lightly about Donald Trump. Do not speak lightly of Justin Trudeau or Valérie Plan or whoever the leader is. Let me read you, and I was so convicted of this this week because I had committed the same mistake. Romans 13, verse 1. You don't have to turn to it. Let every person be subject, let everybody be subject to the governing authorities. Listen. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist right now have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist these authorities 
will incur judgment from God. I just was blown away because that means that even evil leaders, people like Hitler, Mussolini, Mao Zedong, people who have done just atrocities in the world, you show them due respect and honor because God put them there. It says here, those that exist, leaders and rulers that exist, have been instituted by God. And the reason why we submit and we show honor and respect to God, uh, to these leaders, even if they are evil, is because we understand that God is in control of everything. This is why. This is so important for our church. This is so important for many churches. You see, many churches, they break apart, not because of huge sins, but because of a heart of rebellion against their leaders. Even now, as I am preaching to you, three of our Alliance churches are going through major crises. Major crises. Yes, their leaders may be poor leaders. Yes, their leaders may be incompetent. But, O oh church, show your due honor and respect to them. And here it says, pray for them. In verse 18, Pray for us. Pray for your leaders, especially the leaders you don't like. Pray for them. Ask God to change them. And God, when God will do His work, you will just marvel at it. It says here, it tells us how we ought to love our leaders. Verse 17. You obey your leaders and submit to them because they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So a question to ask, a homework for you to think about is, in what way can I be making my leaders more joyful in serving? Especially that leader in your head right now who you don't like. How can you make him more joyful in serving? We're going to now close and enter into a... Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about the communion, but also about why this is so important for us today. And I'm going to read to you from First Peter's. Okay. In First Peter, as Peter says to the church, he says, he says the same thing. He says, for the sake of Christ, submit to every human institution. All of them, submit to them. Whether it be emperors or to governors, submit to them. But he says the reason why you do this is because, he says, because Christ Jesus himself suffered for you. Leaving you an example that you may follow his steps. He committed no sin, neither was there deceit in his mouth. And when he was insulted and reviled by the rulers of his time, he did not revile in return. When he suffered at the hands of sinners, he did not threaten them, though he was the king of glory. But he continued to entrusting himself to God, who judges justly. We are called to submit and obey and give honor and respect to our leaders because we do it to trust our God, to show and to train and to increase our trust in God. Say, God, I, I don't know what to do about this leader, but you do. You put him there, and if you, if it is your will, you take him away. The time will come. But as long as that leader is there, regardless of how much harm he does to you or to others, as long as God allows him to be there, we are called to respect and honor him. You see, Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, he took the, blood, the cup, he took the bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body which is for you. Whenever you eat it, eat it in remembrance of me. And then after the meal, he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. But yesterday, as I was in the Ted and Margaret class, praise God, thank God for, for Margaret, but she shared this story that I had never heard about before. She said that when Jesus Christ, he lifted up the cup and he said, this is the new cup, this new covenant in my blood. He was doing something that only Jewish people understand. 
You see, when the Jewish people, when a Jewish man is going to come and ask for a Jewish lady's hand in marriage, when he's going to come and propose to this woman, well, the thing that they do is he, he strikes up a ketuvah, which is like a marriage contract. He brings that ketuvah to the father's house, to his, his the, the lady's father's house, and he will give that contract to the husband to the father and say, I like to, your hand, your daughter's hand in marriage. I like to marry your daughter. And if the father agrees, then what the, that man will do is he will pour a cup of wine. He will pour that cup of wine. It's called the Kiddushin. I've been learning my Hebrew recently. He takes that cup and he will drink of it. And once he drinks of it, he will give that cup to that lady, to that woman, and say, this is the covenant of marriage that I extend to you. Will you accept it? And if she does, she will drink of that cup and accept that covenant of love. Do you see now that when Jesus raises the cup of the covenant, he's not just raising it as a forgiveness of sins for you and me. He is saying, in his raising of that cup, he's saying, will you now take me as your groom? Will you take me as your husband? That's what it means. Some of you, you may not even know who you are. That you've been purchased by the blood of Christ to be his bride. And every time we come and we take of that cup and we eat of that bread, it is a marriage renewal. It is, we are renewing our vows before our Lord and saying, yes, Jesus, I take that cup and I take your hand in marriage. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to your table of communion now and I pray that you prepare our hearts, you comfort our confusions and our distresses and you prepare our hearts to enter into this marriage covenant that your Son Jesus Christ began 2,000 years ago and that we are renewing today. Do this work for us, we pray, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.